gentlemen, welcome to the night's main event. This is First Friday's November edition. This is November 6, 2020. It's an election year, but that doesn't matter. I have two of my old friends from college. I met Saul and Lee at the University of Louisiana Lafayette, and they both took me under their wings. Saul in his left pit, Lee in her right pit, and we got through it together. And they are two of my, my best friends and the best writers that I went to school with. And there was tens of thousands of us. And so you guys are kind of the cream on the top of the barrel there. Um, and generally what we do, we start with a little Q&A. So I'm going to unmute uh, Saul and Lee, and hopefully there's not too much feedback, but I'm going to just go down the list real quick. If you could have a drink, beers, or cocktails with any writer, living or dead, who would it be? Oscar Douglas Wilde. Douglas Adams. <laughs> Douglas Adams and Oscar Wilde? I might want, I, I, I'm, I'm going to change my answer. Douglas I, Adams. Douglas Adams. <laughs> we're, going, we're going to have drinks all together. Yes. I like Oscar Wilde. I think that would be a, a sexy, wild party, though. I used to have um, like these sorts of, when I worked at a tropical smoothie, we would like be like, well, who would be the best person from history that you can think of to party with? Mm -hmm. You know, like if you were going to yeah. party with somebody, who would be the best? And Oscar Wilde's name came up quite a bit. Wow. A literary crowd at the, the smoothie joint. I had to convince them. And then who, Doug, Douglas Adams? Is that who you guys are going with? Douglas Adams, yeah. Douglas Adams made me fall in love with uh, sci-fi and humor and Hitchhiker's Guide, 42, man. Ah, uh, Douglas Adams. Okay, so you guys was... are both 0 for 1 here. Uh, <laughs> and this, this is going to get serious real quick, but it's been on my mind, and I don't even know how to answer it myself, but should we kind of cancel or boycott certain writers or even artists that do stupid shit. I'm thinking of, for music, R. Kelly peeing on women, but for writers, uh, J.K. Rowling recently being maybe transphobic. Should we get all we can out of art or, sh or, or some people, they go too far. Should we just sh try to shut them up and boycott them? Where do you stand on this issue? I struggle with financially supporting someone who's acting in a reprehensible way. Okay. I, uh, that being said, I still teach uh, Sherman Alexie's short stories in some of my classes. Um, so I think it's a hard question. I don't know that there's any clear, clean answers, but I do think in terms of money sometimes, is this someone I wanna give my money to? Yeah. It's like a vote. We're not yeah. talking about the election, but it's like a vote. Yeah. Saul, yeah. what do you say? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, we all have connections to certain stories or movies or whatever that we liked when we were younger. So I think there's, um, you can, if so long as you can separate, you know, your appreciation for that thing that you really, really liked at that time in your life. And you can still have that, you know, that moment can be important to you. That story can be important to you and like, after all of those things happen, if you find out the person's garbage, then that can also be true. Two things can also can be true at the same time. Like uh, I had this, you know, we had this, we, we wrote a bunch of stories about Mel Gibson in our um, fiction and no, form fiction class, sort of that approached this in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. At least. Um, yeah, Sherman Alexie. I'm, I'm thinking about the world's toughest Indian, and mm -hmm. and there's that's be that's a beautiful story. So if you can gain from it and not yeah. contribute to him financially, maybe that's the best way to go about it. I don't know. Let's get less serious for a second here. Uh, worst worst writing advice you've ever gotten? Cut every adjective. You I like just think it. that's, I think that's terrible advice. You know, some adjectives are important. Yeah. You know? That's why there's a word for them, huh? I, I think, yeah, I think it's, I think that these, like, 
here's a rule and you must just completely get rid of a section of your vocabulary or you, you must, you must, any sort of absolute and I get real, real crook eyed at it. I'm not, I'm not real comfortable with people making absolutes about writing at the very least. Yeah. I even think it's okay to use cliches if it's deliberate and appropriate. Like people there's, talk. There's some cool like cliches that. out there. You know, there's yeah. a reason. They're just metaphors. Yeah. <laughs> Saul, anything come to mind? Um, Lee, Lee stole my question. She didn't. Um, she had an answer. Stole your she stole, I should say she stole my answer. Yeah. Um, one time I was telling a friend that I like about a story um, when, from when I was younger, which is the only instance um, when like I was over, you know, four years old, I was probably like 10 at the time. The only instance of my like adult life or semi-adult life where I pooped my pants and they were like, you should write a story about that. That was bad advice. Really? Cause I, right now I'm <laughs> thinking to myself, I, I want to read that story. <laughs> bad advice. Oh, wait, I have another one. I mean, you can... If you don't write every day, you'll never be a real writer. Oh, yeah. Which is to say that anyone who has a job and like responsibilities and can't always get there, I don't know, has a cold, will never be a writer. I just yeah. think that's, I think that's really elitist. Or it's of, like uh, seven, 2,000 words by uh, 7 a.m. Join the yeah. club for a month. If you can, sure. But uh, I mean, I'm not, that, I'm not going to be there. Yeah. Um, and then a quick last one, best writing snack. If you could have one writing snack, only one more forevermore, what's it going to be? Writing snack, fuel for the cerebral. Does coffee count? I'll allow it. Judges? It's yeah. Not Coffee's not a snack. I, no. That's no, we're not going to allow that. I apologize. That's like oxygen. We're not giving up the coffee just so we can have a cookie. <laughs> well, that said, Lee, what are you going to go with? Oh, man. So I want to do the cop out of like something like chocolate, but that's, again, too big a category. Um, but, but seriously, you know those like miniatures? You know the bag of like, you know, it's like little bitty Snickers and little bitty Three Musketeers and, and little Goodman. bitty... Yeah. You know, those little bitty, and some of them are crappy, right? Like some of them you don't want. Um, I think that's the perfect writing sack because you can kind of like, even the bad ones are something. Yeah. But you get that, the variety. Yeah. I got but you. But I'm a candy girl. I'm sure Saul's is healthier. Saul's going to go bratwurst from Green Bay, I have a feeling. But Saul, is it going to be sausage? What are you going to do? I mean, that would be fantastic. I don't like snack when I'm writing. Squeaky snack. cheese. What, do you have a cocktail, a drink, coffee? Um, I, I, when I used to write in the evenings, which I don't anymore, I would, like back in my mid-20s or whatever. Wow. You grow nice. a beard and all of a sudden you're a, a new man. I don't <laughs> Um. Enough, enough of this small talk, you guys. I'm, I'm, thank you for those candid remarks, but I'm going to pass it over. Saul is going to be our first reader. I don't have your bio. I know I went to school with you. You have a PhD. You published a book of short stories that I love called Kayfabe and Other Stories. Other than that, is there anything you want to say to introduce us to your work? Um, I teach, um, other than that, I, I teach English, uh, I'm sorry, American literature and Creative writing at Hanover College in Indiana. Um, shout out to the students who came. Hi. Um, other than that, yeah, I mean, I just the stories are what they are. They're some people like to call them surreal. Some people like to call them absurdists. I mean, you can you can take from it whatever you want to. Okay, thanks, all. Should I just start or what's going? I on? would just start reading things when you're ready. <laughs> Okay, well, this first story is called San Antonio. It was published in X-Ray Lit Mag. Um, if you're interested in seeing this story, you can find a link to it on my website, which is solemaran.com. Uh, the next story as well. So just plug in that. Um, otherwise, here we go. San Antonio. Uh, the piglet was pink. 
but not the regular pink that you expect piglets to be. This was a sort of glowing warm pink that only exists in Disney movies. God, the little animal was so cute. Yancey wanted to squeeze the thing to death. Wanted to squeeze it till his head popped off its precious little body. Tim and John, who are friends of Yancey, think this too. He is so lucky, they think, as they stand beside him, wishing they could also have one. Yancey reaches out and pets the piglet on its snout, which offers a high-pitched oink. This is right. Rightly right. He names his piglet, piglet Norman. Norman smiles, and Norman's smile is a demon smile. There's an air of danger about Norman, which only makes Yancey desire him more. He picks him up, thinking, my mother will like this piglet. He looks over to his friend Tim, who is tall and reminds Yancey of those bronze statues of cowboys, Stetson-headed, rugged, and life-loving. Now, a piglet has appeared at his feet. John, who is dashingly handsome and reminds Yancey of a younger version of himself, also looks down to find one. This is strange. Yes, they admit that. But they're excited. They know a good thing when they see it, and they brace themselves psychically for what promises to be a considerable amount of sexual attention. Yancey looks at Tim. Tim looks at Yancey. They smile at one another. The attention, it seems, is already here. Tom thinks, how beauteous these piglets are. Oh, what brave new world that has such creatures in it. They take pictures and record video of the piglets and post it on their many profiles. Tom names his piglet Worthington. Worthington, like Norman, has a grin of a hungry hobgoblin. Yancey's mother is a starchy woman who sits very much upright and likes real estate investments, investments and index funds. And so she has a drooping heart and an aching soul and her mood is in constant need of cheering. Her name is Mildred. What a cute little pig! Mildred shouts when she sees Norman. She tries very hard to hide her jealousy, which is a very ugly part of her that she never acknowledges. But oh, will you look at that? Mildred didn't notice at first, but she has a piglet standing to her, next to her as well, sniffing her fern green flats. Where did this little guy come from? Mildred asks without meaning it, because she, because as she says, this is the cutest thing I have ever seen in my entire adult life. I will name him Weatherford. He looks like a Weatherford, don't you think? She, like Yancey and his friends, is excited about the attention this piglet will afford her, sexual and otherwise. They take out their phones. Pictures are exchanged. Mildred sends a picture of Weatherford to her friend, Francine. Francine sends Mildred a picture of her new piglet, Hamlet. Hamlet, like Weatherford, is adorable, yet also menacing. It's a profoundly joyous time, and they make sure to post this on their profiles. There are many questions about where the piglets came from and why they are here. These questions seem important, but not as important as, say, actually having a piglet. The piglets are mysterious, to be sure. Everyone agrees. They will investigate. Of course, of course they will. Later. Then a message comes. Arbuckle just ate John. Yancey looks at his phone and wonders if this is a typo. If instead of eight, they meant at, at John, makes a lot more sense than eight John. But no, a photo is shared with the little adorable Arbuckle, John had named his piglet Arbuckle, chewing on John's foot, still in its classic Western boot. So there is a funeral. Everyone at John's funeral who doesn't have a piglet finds one for them there. They are dangerous, these piglets. It could not be denied since they are attending a funeral for a man who is just eaten by one, but that just adds to their titillation. Thus, the occasion is an emotionally wrought one. Everyone loves their piglet, but at the same time, they do not know if they can trust them. Tim looks at Yancey. Yancey looks at Tim. The death of their good friend has brought them closer than ever. During the funeral, Hamlet attacks Francine. Hamlet leaps, leaps up and takes a fleshy chunk right out of her neck, right where the where most people imagine the carotid artery probably is. The other piglets, seeing this, jump aboard the flesh wagon and take what they can get. They eat muscle, bone, tendons, and teeth, and when they are finished, there is nothing left. Mildred takes out her phone and reports this to several organizations who make it their business to keep data on such things. They are very interested. Everyone puts this on their many personal profiles. It seems to the mourners as if time stops, and the whole scene is frozen in tableau. Yancey, now more emotionally wrought than before, looks at Tim. Tim looks back. Suspended between them is an aerosol of terror, disgust, and desire. 
fire. The horror sharpens slowly, like the point of an icicle in early springtime. Then everything begins to move again. Tim pukes in the, in a, in the large clay pot of a fe, fe, ficus benjamina. Uh, several others join him. Many fear they will be next. They inspect their piglets who oink at them dismissively. So dangerous and yet so cute. Later, when they are still alive and uneaten, it becomes clear to everyone that their piglets will either eat them or they won't. Yancey sits down and reflects on these uncertain times. He wonders if he is in love with Tim. Tim does not wonder. Tim knows. The two of them sit together and drink coffee. I want that piglet, a voice shouts. Across the street, there's a group of people with no piglets and a single man who has one. It is strange to Yancey and Tim. These people do not care the piglets are dangerous. People, it seems, have a complicated relationship with danger. They think there might be violence. But then a drove of piglets runs up, and now there's exactly enough piglets for everyone. Tim kneels down in front of Yancey and proposes. Yancey calls his mother Mildred. Her face appears on his phone, smiling. Weatherford is in the background. He's adorable. The threat of him, Yancey thinks, somehow adds to his appeal. But he doesn't understand why. He tells his mother that Tim has proposed. Life is too short, he says. And he wants a Texas wedding. Across the street, one of the new piglet owners is being devoured by his adoptive little pink package of joy. All of the other piglets join in on the meat buffet. Blood sprays everywhere and the shock and smell of the wet naked viscera sends several observers to vomit in the gutters lining the side of the street. Yancey turns his phone around so that his mother can watch. Mildred says his, sends this information to the appropriate data collection agencies. Then she congratulates them. By the way, what a good couple they will make. The drift of piglets let out long lines, high pitched like a host of porcine cicadas. Tim records all of this on his phone, live streaming to followers with similar interests. The piglets do not stop their whining, they just keep going. Oh, how cute, they're singing, Yancey thinks. Is there no end to their precious benefits? These are interesting times, uncertain, yes, destabilizing and frightening, of course, but interesting to be sure. Another piglet begins to eat its new keeper. It starts at the leg and the screams that follow are uncanny. Yancey, Mildred says, and Yancey turns his phone around to face his mother. I'm so happy, she says, for you, and that my Weatherford is kind and gentle. My Norman, too, Yancey says, lifting the singing piglet up to nuzzle his neck. He is so happy to be with Tim and Worthington. I cannot believe how many people have joined my live stream, Tim says. We should take one of those lollipop carriages through downtown, Yancey says, happy to have finally found joy in this world. And the gutter runs thick with wretch and gore. Thanks. That was San Antonio. Uh, um, <laughs> thank you thank you yeah uh so this next <laughs> That's good. thank you dustin um this That's next good. oh this next or, or do i have I, I yeah this next story is called natchez funeral um it's about a funeral in Nac in natchitoches so here we go uh my boss's funeral has been long and apparently the diamond he's supposed to be buried with is missing my mother's been dead for years and i never knew my father I couldn't find it, the boss's son, the new boss, whispers to me. He thinks his sister has it, I know, because he's told me several times. There's something about the old boss in this state, so stoic, so resting nobly in front of the altar, that I find incredibly attractive. I wish I could bring myself to weep, my new boss says, but dad always said tears were the refuge of weak constitutions and malingerists. Presumably, he's angry and clenching his fists because he thinks his sister stole his father's diamond. I don't think you have a weak constitution, I tell him liltingly, because I'm distracted by the dead old man and because I believe the son's been embezzling for years, like the rest of the executive staff. He looks up towards his sister, who's been eulogizing for over 20 minutes, and says, I wish she was in that coffin. I don't. I feel an intense, masculine energy radiating from the old boss's corpse, and I want it. Whatever it is, I want it. For a second, I think I can hear my mother calling, but she's not here. The old boss is. I can't believe he's not with us anymore, the old boss's daughter says again for a fifth time still eulogizing. At least she had a father. Mine left before I can remember and could be alive or dead. I couldn't know. What's inside the old boss, though, 
I can know. And I find myself standing up and walking towards him up the center aisle, up the center aisle because he's oozing stately, manly vibrations that I know can fill the emptiness inside of me left from the absence of anything my father might have meant to me. The sister stops her eulogy. What are you doing, she asks. Everyone turns their heads. Your father, I say, I'm going to go inside him. The crowd gasps. The old boss's son, the new boss, stands up, pointing at his sister. She did it, he yells. She stole our father's diamond. She's betrayed the family. The sister's mouth drops open. Lies, she hisses. The crowd gasps again. I run past the sister and jump into the casket, straddling the old man, his dead features potent and virile. Then I rip open his chest. Inside, I see a distant nuclear green light and hear the thump, thump, thump of dance music and knocked over by people marching right out of the boss, right out of his chest. These people wear jester masks with puffy purple, green, and gold costumes, and I know it's a Mardi Gras parade as they come out dancing, followed by a color guard of expert skill, and then a marching band, also of expert skill, and then a crew de Bacchus float that's shaped like a dazzling streetcar, and everyone in the nave cheers and dives through the air and onto the floor trying to catch the beads and coins that are thrown out by the passing crew. Last out is an alligator that walks on two legs and carries one of those giant wooden mallets you see at carnivals. Once free, the nuclear green light rushes out from deep within the chest in a beam that cuts a hole in the ceiling so everyone can see the sky above. Fireworks burst against the night stars. Mother's voice calls again. The indomitable, vigorous, handsome nuclear green invites. I'm mesmerized. And the alligator, she joyously smashes the heads of company executives. One head, two head, three head, four. Until finally she brings down her mallet on the old boss's son, the new boss, and there's a diamond where his head used to be. It's the size of a grapefruit and the alligator lifts it up high yelling, I found it, I found the grapefruit diamond, I found it, the grapefruit diamond. She shows it off to everyone shouting, it has power, you have none, give it to me. The old new boss's sister pleads, give it to me, pleads the new new boss who is the old boss's younger brother and the old old boss's second son and the crowd chants, give Give it, give it, give it, repeatedly. And while the alligator throws the diamond up into the air where it hangs like a brilliant and hypnotic disco ball, I'm climbing inside the chest of this man I've come to love, the old, old boss. And I float in absolute accepting green radiance. It seeps down between my eyes and every other crack, fissure, and hollow. And I see my mother. I see my mother showing me how to sweep and wash the floors, to take out the trash, making sure the lid's attached, to open a checking account, to save money, to drive a car, to pay bills, to use my phone to figure out how to fix broken pipes and electrical outlets. Her eyes are shining rubies and she says, and I was here the whole time. Isn't that funny? Yeah, it's absolutely side splitting. There's fading calls for celebration coming from the church. Her body fades and only the two red stones remain. Don't be a snot, she says. Her voice echoes against the backdrop of a million empty greennesses. Not everybody has to do their same job their whole life. Have you ever thought of getting a new one? She's right, of course. She always did have a way with words. So that's a story. <laughs> Yeah, really, really, yeah, really fun. I enjoyed the ride. I mean, that's probably the most visceral term I can bring to it. But uh, I, I, I studied a lot with Do Donald Barthelme, and this reminds me of Barthelme in a, in a big, big way. Uh, I admire yeah. his work a lot. Yeah, well, he's yeah, he 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 definitely is uh, one of my my own main mentors. But uh, anyway, I, I just totally enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. I wish we could all clap. Can we? Maybe we can. I don't know. There you go.
So I'm supposed to be reading from my new book, uh, Moon Trees and Other Orphans, but I'm not going to. So instead, I'm just going to show it to you. Uh, and I'm not going to because I want to read new stuff, because Saul told me I should read new stuff. Um, so it's not that new. Uh, I'm working on a novel. Oh, I teach at Beacon College in Florida. I teach humanities and English. I guess I should say that. Um, so this is uh, this is the prologue and the intro to a novel I've been working on for a while. Um, so should I just go? All right. All right, guys, um, my eyesight's not great and I'm waiting for new glasses, so hopefully I can do this without making a fool of myself. The prologue uh, is very short uh, and it's um, it's two months after chapter one. So it's one of those annoying prologues that, that harkens to the end of the book. Prologue, Bayou Kane, August, 2012. Rana cannot speak, even though she's eight years old, certainly old enough to have mastered her vocal cords, lips, tongue. Rana is incapable of yelling out to her sister that a smell, a smell not quite like gasoline spilling from the undercarriage of a rusted out four-wheeler, a smell darker, heavier than that, is choking her. It's a black smell. It burns her nose. It lays across her tongue in a crude slick. It's so strong that it hides the tangy rot from a pile of dead fish on the bank, a pile abandoned by their father after cleaning a catch he'd shocked from the bayou's depths with an old telephone magneto he ordered off the internet, the catfish all mushed and crawling now. The black smell is that strong, able to cover wet death and rot. Neither of Rana's older siblings are nearby. Her eyes roll and she does not find Luli, cannot find where in the surrounding woods she has disappeared to as she hunts for their missing brother, Bub. Just months ago, Rana could have yelled that the ground where she sits in the grass is moving. It is rocking. It is sliding under her thighs. It feels like she is being pulled in jerks on a blanket, sort of like a terrible version of a game they play in the trailer where Bob sleds her around corners in an old quilt and Lily screams to be careful. Except Rana is all alone. She cannot speak. But she has not forgotten being able to bellow out words to make herself heard, sitting in the stinking, bucking dirt, knowing that she could have once called for help, it infuriates her. People see her in her wheelchair or the wagon her family sometimes uses to shuttle her about, and they imagine she is not much more than a doll, empty. But Rana is not empty. The ground is becoming soft, sinking mush like the fish on the bank. She wonders if that is what an earthquake is, the land on a, in a constant state of becoming, becoming mobile, becoming wet, becoming not ground at all, but a soggy monster pitching Rana over her tender doubled legs. She cannot scream for help, but she is no doll. And she begins to crawl forward on strong willed arms, collapsing only when she sees the body, pearlescent and bloated and splayed like much swamp garbage. Uh, so chapter one is two months earlier, same bayou, and it centers on Luli, Rana's older sister. It's the middle of summer and it is unbearably hot. The Chevy Nova that Luli is waiting for is late. She's tired of squatting in the bushes, craning her neck to watch an empty road. She's 10 days from 18 and thick around the edges. Her legs are strong and accustomed to hard work, but they're starting to cramp. She shifts, pulls at her cutoffs, slaps mosquito after mosquito from her shoulders, her arms, her face, her scalp. She isn't sure if she's better off in the full muggy buggy grip of the overgrowth or just outside it, balancing on that little strip of concrete between lowland brush and asphalt where the sun burns sweat to salt just as soon as it appears. Either way, She's sick of spending her life making the choice between shit and shit. This morning, Bonnie, her mother, had insisted she come out here, do this stupid, stupid thing for the family. Again, she tapped torn nails on the linoleum counter instead of pouring out corn pops or whatever it is normal mothers do between hugs on Sundays. 
Through their argument, Bonnie quieted her deep voice instead of raising it, a sure sign of hell to pay if Lily pushed too hard, which she did. Lily shakes the fight from her thoughts. She needs to concentrate, get her head right and good. The man driving her parents' Chevy Nova will be tipsy. Bonnie will have slipped a drink or two into his hand while he circled the car. She'll have acted dumb, desperate, so that he's confident that he is the one hustling the poor, uneducated swamp rats. Car like that, price like it was, they must be a couple of rubes. The buyer won't have noticed Bonnie and White deliberately liquoring him up. He will have sipped absently as they chattered around him, oblivious to the way the drinks were filled themselves. He won't worry about the dents in the Nova's hood, dents that fit the curve of a small, thick shoulder. He'll barely glance at the notch above the right headlamp from the time two years ago when Lily's back hit wrong and her crying hadn't been faked. This is what Lily's role is in the family. She gets hit and she's fucking good at it. The Nova is beautiful, but it isn't exactly cherry. The thing is, the car is rare. A 68 SS with a 365 big block that White claims he won in a bet over in Natchez when he was 17 on the set of The Adventures of Huck Finn, if you can believe it. Lit a match with a little piss of a pistol. You should have seen the crew's faces. He won the car the same year he married Bonnie. While Lily waits in the bushes, the guy back at the house, the buyer, will be oblivious to her parents circling him while he circles their very, very, very underpriced gym. Vultures, the three of them. So, he'll be tipsy at best, drunk at worst. He might slow down the Nova when Lily lunges in front of it, but he might speed up, might even stop in time. No way to be sure. But, Lily repeats to herself, she is good at this. She is great. White, her pop, would even say she's the best. He'd started teaching her on an old trampoline he scavenged when Lily was maybe five, maybe younger, teaching her how to be fast, limber, how to twist in the air, how to fall, making it fun. Other kids went to soccer or t-ball or gymnastics. Lily went to White's school of slip and fall, house of fuck the man and fuck whoever White thought might be the man, maybe even anyone who sat next to the man who voted for the man or anybody at all who is better off than White and his brood and therefore was obviously in cahoots with the man. She was Pop's star pupil back then. After all, Bub wasn't made for this part of the family business and Rana was well Rana. There's a small noise far off and Lily's head snaps up. She lowers her body, finally. The chittering whine of the Nova's loose fan belt zips through the air. She pumps her legs to get feeling back, but stays as low as she can, mostly out of sight. She tenses her calves. She can hear the big rocks, rocks she's wedged in the front tire tread, in the front tire tread click toward her. The noise is at first easy to mistake for ambient sound, but it grows. Bonnie's radio station pours down the road. First rule, know when the hit is coming. Second rule, control your body. The key here is to jump at just the right moment so that you land high on the hood, miss the grill. The key is to turn your body just so, make sure your soft spots are safe. It is to relax because tight muscles equal broken bones. It's a shot of liquid courage, cheap whiskey or vodka or rum, whatever you like, long enough before you hop the curb and step in front of an oncoming car so that the booze can do its thing, turn your body to rubber and let you bounce. The key is to close your eyes and call on the Mother Mary and see her light and step right into the warmth of her voice and tell no one ever that you think you talk to the wife and mama of God himself that you hallucinate. Lily closes her eyes. The mother smells like peach cobbler and jasmine blooms and tells Lily that everything today, everything tomorrow and the day after and the one after that will be okay. The mother sometimes lies. Lily launches out of the book at bushes, sneakers hit the road, knees bend, and then she is flying and the mother is humming Pearl Jam and everything is light and good. And then Lily hits the hood of the Chevy Nova and there is a no noise like dough hitting a kitchen counter, a solid noise. And then the mother is gone. And then there is the spin and the road and the tight familiar pain. Temporary pain, White will say. Everything is temporary, baby, except the fun. 
That's what White always says as he checks her over for breaks among the bruises when he puts the ice, then heat on her aches. But for now, she screams. She makes herself scream. In the real world, the world outside of the con, Luli never screams or cries. In the real world, when Luli is hurt, she clams the hell up. But for the benefit of the guy, the buyer, panicked and stepping out of her parents' Nova, she screams bloody, nerve or, bloody murder. Holy crap, holy hell, holy fuck. That's Bonnie's voice, mama. She won't mention the man, to the man that Luli is her oldest daughter. They don't really look alike. Bonnie is taller, bonier, hair a little lighter, skin a little lighter. The guy is a white dude, a white leather jacket wearing dude. And he is hyperventilating, cool, slipping out of him with each breath. Crap, crap, he says. Are you? But he stops himself. Hey, kid, what the hell were you thinking? He is scared, not mad. And he has a nice, deep voice, even if he is trying to blame her for the accident. She can see the sweat and shake of panic spread across him, and she feels bad. But she pulls herself together, finds her own anger, her courage. Only a douche goes on like that without even checking if the person they hit is okay, she reminds herself. Still, his voice is nice. Luli heaves her chest and wails. You hit her, Bonnie says again. It's a script. Luli knows all the parts. She fights the urge to mouth along with her mother. Instead, she keeps her eyes closed tight, tight, but she knows Bonnie is pulling out her phone, taking pictures of the guy. Hey, what are you doing? His voice is like a train roaring. It's deeper than any voice she has ever heard. It's like a tornado, like maybe if she was very still and Bonnie would shut the hell up and the birds and toads and crickets stopped chirping, she could hear his voice in her chest and not just her ears, that deep. If she were another girl, she'd hear that voice in a cafe or behind her in line at the movies and she'd try to flirt, but she isn't. Her head hurts and she's having trouble concentrating, but she didn't hit it in the fall. She's positive. Third rule, protect your, your brain pan, always. Bonnie keeps pointing the phone's camera his way. And you're drunk, she says, as if astonished, ashamed. You hit that poor child, and you've been drinking, saying it for the camera. It was past time for Luli to stumble out of the scream and look the man full in the eye, the hard part. Luli may be good at falling and landing and getting the shit kicked out of her and at hollering and screaming up a storm, but she doesn't much like the part where she has to interact. You she said. You hit me. It isn't long before the man's wallet is open, the cash he'd come prepared to buy the Nova with sliding into Luli's hands to help her get checked out. See a doctor, tell her that her leg isn't cracked up. I'm sure it ain't broke, honey, the man says, trying to pat her arm and not touch her all at once. No need to call the cops, right? No need to get anyone else involved. You see that, don't you? Is that enough, honey? The kind of money will get you all checked out and then some. You know that, right? You're okay, aren't you, honey? It is a fat, fat wad of cash. And Lily is happy that she met the man here and not somewhere else where she would think he was nice and not the sort of guy to buy his way out of trouble. Was glad for a moment that she knew that everyone was that sort of guy. Bonnie tells him what a good dude he is, doing the right thing by that poor girl. Puts him in the passenger seat and drives him back to their trailer, the ship shack, where his old boring car waits for him to get in it and forget the Nova and their tiny bayou forever. Her mother and the man will leave Luli to pick her own self up, dust her own self off, limp on home slowly enough that he'll be good and gone by the time she gets there. Under Bonnie's capable hands, the Nova spins into a tight three-point turn and purrs away. White may have originally won the car, but it is Mama's baby. And though she leaves that belt loose for special occasions, Bonnie keeps the engine and transmission in perfect fighting shape. Luli pushes through the bushes and slumps into a small, clear patch of thorny grass. There's blood seeping through the, the knee of her jeans, so she rolls them up to inspect the damage. A bruise blooms around a wide scrape, looking like a rose opening in a time-lapse video, like squid ink billowing across a lens. It is a fast thing, faster than biology would, could allow. It is the mother's virgin mouth. It is a cavern opening and swallowing the world. 
Circling Lily on the grass, Bub's shadow is squat, a fat bob, a fat blob, a lie. Bub is Bonnie's boy, her spitting in an image, tall and thin, all marathon legs and broad, cool guy shoulders and thick, grown out hair, a wide, dark halo, just a little greasy from sweat. Him and Lily look enough alike that you could tell they are related. Same snub nose, same tall forehead, same curls and cowlicks in their black hair. But different enough, you could imagine Bub stuffing Lily's five foot frame in a locker. Stop looming, Lily says. He nudges her with his foot. Bonnie sent me to find you, says stop fucking around and come home. She wants to put that cash up. Lily checks the flip phone she lifted from a corner shop in New Orleans. 30 minutes lost time longer than the last time she had one of her episodes. Since when are you the errand boy? Don't you have practice? Since when do you care? The nudge becomes a kick or stay and give me the money, whatever. Lily puts a hand out and lets her brother pull her to standing. Race you to the water, she says, like they're 12 again. And she launches into a wild run, all loose legs and flying arms before he's even straightened himself. She leaps over knobby fire ant mounds and rotting stumps and dewberry tangles, ignoring the echoes of impact on her aching bones and muscles, echoes of classic car hood and suddenly stopped kinetic energy and crumbling asphalt all pressing painfully into her body. She is free and Bonnie and the shit shack are in the other direction. She doesn't check to see if Bub is behind her. He'll catch up quickly enough without the help. He's a lightning runner. Instead, she closes her eyes in short bursts, spurts, just long enough to feel exhilarated and afraid running in the dark, but not long enough to lose complete sight of the ground to miss a hurdle. She runs and runs, the edge of the bayou coming clean into view, the ground getting softer, damp, then a shaking pulls her up short, stumbling her over a root. For the smallest moment, the earth groans, trembling and rippling under her feet a little like a wet dog trying to shimmy loose a day in the river. Off balance and confused, she falls to the bruised knee and scrapes her palm against a rock that, as far as she can tell, has moved of its own volition. She lolls her head sideways to see behind her. Bub is stopped in his tracks, stock still, head cocked to the side, staring at the ground. He felt it too then. It really happened, the quivering. It's not in her mind, not another episode. In front of her, a spot in the water, maybe two feet around, bubbles, boils. Bub, did you feel that? Bub, he trots up next to her and she points at the roiling water and they stand there watching it like they might watch a pot on the stove. Nothing to say, but their hands touch like when they were kids, the same as when Bonnie and White came home with bruises and thick breath and Luli and Bub had to be the ones to heat the milk for Rana's bottle. The sound of both of them breathing mixes with the sound of burbling water and listening to it, Lily is afraid.